Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on our CPE uh, session on a, a governmental specific topic. What we're going to be covering today for, for everybody is we're going to be talking about COVID-19 funding. We've got uh, some content today talking about the best practices on, on managing and accounting for, for COVID-19 funding. Um, we'll talk about the accounting treatment, you know, how, how it should be accounted for. Uh, and, and we're also going to talk a lot about single audit implications uh, of, of receiving COVID-19 funding. Um, so it's going to be an interesting session today. It's, it's obviously been a very hot topic uh, for, for the past couple of years now, the COVID-19 funding. Um, so it's so a really, it's been co complicated, a lot, lot to learn, and, and uh, we're going to hopefully cover it pretty thoroughly here today for you. This is this is going to be a, a two-hour two-hour session, two two CPE hours being earned from this session. Um, you you, uh, you need to be logged in on your own unique uh, login to get the credit for the CPE. So so please, if you're here for, for the CPE credits, make sure you're you're logged in with your own unique link. Um, we do not offer any partial CPE for this, so you, you do need to participate fully to get the full two hours or it's nothing. And, and to get CPE credit, you must answer 80% of the polling questions. I think there's 12 polling questions today. You must answer 80%. You do not need to get them correct, but they must be answered in order to get credit. And uh, to, to get your certificate, that, that, that'll be emailed out within, within about seven days of today. And, and if you do have any issues, contact our marketing team. There's the, the marketing email address there, marketing at CRICPA.com. But uh, yeah, contact them with any questions or, or issues. But let's get into it. We have uh, some wonderful presenters for you here today. Uh, let me introduce them. First of all, uh, oh, there she is, Gwen mansfield Vote. Uh, she is a partner uh, in our Albuquerque office, and she's uh, she's absolutely wonderful presenter. Does a lot of uh, speaking engagements and presentations and educational uh, cl classes, especially as it relates to single audit. Uh, that that's a, a, an immense area of specialty for Gwen. Uh, so I was really excited she was able to to do this session with us today. Uh, I know she's going to have a lot of great stuff to share, uh, especially around the single audit stuff. So so that that's Gwen. Uh, she'll be our first presenter and our second presenter will be April Shooping, another terrific presenter who, who's really been working in depth and had a lot of hands-on experience working with uh, stimulus funding, this, the COVID funding. She, she's helped a number of governments implement it and, uh, and has really learned and, and, and understood a heck of a lot. And, and she's also learned and seen a lot of examples of, of governments who've struggled. So she's going to be able to share a lot of good examples of, of kind of how to avoid pitfalls, you know, what, what, what not to do in, in some cases. So I'm, I'm really excited April was able to, to join us today. So she'll be our second presenter. And then, then there's me. I haven't even introduced myself yet. My name's Robert Lemon. I, I, I'm a, a partner, a governmental specialist as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the Albuquerque office along with Gwen. And uh, I'll just be the, the facilitator today. I'll be launching the polling questions and, uh, and, and going through, keeping things moving um, and, and, and going through any submitted questions that, that we receive at, at the end. We'll, 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 so if you do have questions during the presentation, submit them in the chat or the Q&A, and we will uh, we'll try and cover those at the end if time allows. So that'll be my role. Um, and then... What are we going to cover? I, you know, I summarized it in the beginning, but let's 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 look at the agenda and, and the order we're going to cover things in uh, specifically. First up, we'll we'll talk about what's eligible to uh, eligible expenses under the Coronavirus Relief Fund, so often referred to as the CARES Act, but technically, you know, the, the governmental portion of the funding was the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Then we'll look at eligible expend expenditures specific for, for, for um, schools and education under the Education Stabilization Fund that was for K through 12 schools. Then we'll look at the Educational Stabilization Fund, the HEERF funding. And then we'll get into a little bit about the accounting treatment for all this stimulus funding. What are the debits and credits uh, that should be applied? 
Then we're going to talk about single audit requirements and pitfalls, what I mentioned earlier, you know, looking at where, where things could go wrong. In addition, we'll talk about how to stay compliant and maintain controls. You know, that's what the single auditors are going to be looking for. So compliance and controls, we'll talk about that. And we'll wrap things up with the latest round of funding, the American Rescue Plan. Um, so, so we'll talk a little bit about that at the end as well. So that's our agenda. I, I think it's going to be really good, interesting content. Uh, I know we've got great presenters who are about to, to dive in and, and get us started here. But, uh, but that's the order we'll be covering things in here today. So we'll move to the next slide, please. And it's at this point that I will turn things over to Gwen and she will discuss eligible expenditures specific to the Coronavirus Relief Fund. So Gwen, over to you. Thanks for the introduction um, to our presentation today, Rob. Always great to hear your voice. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Rob said, we'll start with some information here on the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Since this is all pretty much wrapping up as of this time, we won't spend a whole lot of time here, but uh, just kind of a refresher, and especially as we are starting to get documentation together for the next round of single audits that is going to concern this funding. Okay, so a few basics here. Uh, as Rob said earlier, this was a big part of the CARES Act back in the spring of 2020. Um, originally, the deadline for spending the funds was in December of 2020, but it was extended later up to December 31st of this year. So any funding that is still out there now, if that can be spent in the next three weeks or so, that would be a good idea to do so. So the purpose of this funding overall was to prepare for, prevent, and respond to the coronavirus pandemic. And this money did go out directly to all states and to larger local governments. I believe the cutoff there was populations of $500,000 or greater. And then a lot of that funding was then passed down on to smaller local governments and school districts, nonprofits, and even for-profit businesses and local communities. Okay, so the common uses of those funds were for relief to businesses, individuals and other entities such as nonprofits and smaller governments that were affected by the pandemic. Um, just personally, some of what I saw it used for in this area, you know, a lot of governments did give out small grants to businesses that were forced to close for a while or forced to um, incur some additional expenses. Also, individuals and families whose workplaces may have been shut down or, again, incurred some additional expenses that had not been planned for prior to the COVID pandemic. And then similar costs out to nonprofits, of course, and other local governments. So, so that was a, a very common use of these funds, was actually giving out those grants to businesses and individuals. Um, there was also a lot of purchase of supplies for adapting to the social distancing. You know, everything from the plexiglass barriers in front of the receptionist's desks. You know, I, went, I had a doctor's appointment yesterday afternoon and there's still all of the stickers on the floor for where you have to stand and there's still all the barriers and the table up front where they take your temperature, all of those sorts of costs were eligible uses of these funds. Um, payroll for public safety and health personnel. This is one area where the guidance changed kind of midstream with these funds uh, to where the, the federal government basically ended up coming in and saying, hey, pretty much everybody that was in a public safety or health position, you can go ahead and charge their payroll to this fund because their whole entire job and duties were so changed up due to this pandemic. You know, we think it's fair that you're allowed to use this funding for those individuals. 
And then other positions, if they were doing work directly related to the COVID-19 response, you know, that would take a little bit more documentation. Could be administrators who were uh, working with the administration of the grant, for example. Um, that's something that could be charged there with some additional documentation of what that time was spent on. And we'll move into our first polling question here. Rob, take it away. Thank you, Gwen. So I will launch the poll and then read it. So the question number one, what is the federal deadline to expend the coronavirus relief funds? Is it December 30, 2020, December 31, 2020, December 30, 2021, December 31, 2021. Excellent. I'm going to give everybody um, a, a few moments here, maybe, maybe 10 seconds or so. So to do try and get your answers in fairly quickly. Um, you know, again, you do not need to get it correct to get credit. Um, and whilst uh, the, the last few answers are coming in, I'll just emphasize what, what Gwen said on that previous slide, you know, the, the public safety payroll, that was a big, uh, a, a, a big relief for a lot of people struggling to spend their funding and that, that enabled a lot of people to get uh, to use a lot of their funds. So as Gwen said earlier, if, if you've got leftover funds that need to be spent in the next couple of weeks, and I'm, I'm giving away the polling question a little bit here, um, then, then that's often an area that, that quickly you can assign some of the funding to and, and get credit uh, and, and charge some of that to, to the grant. Um, so I'm going to close this poll in the next uh, couple of seconds. So if you've got an answer, throw it in right now, or you will not get credit for this first question. And I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results and then turn it back to Gwen to, uh, to, to summarize those results. Thanks, Rob. So the current deadline is indeed December 31st, 2021. 82% answered that uh, correctly. The original deadline there was actually December 30th, 2020. So it was a little unusual on that it was the 30th and not the 31st. Okay, and we just have a few best practices here as that coronavirus relief funding is wrapped up. You know, first, make sure that you're retaining supporting documentation for all expenses charged to the grant and you know, really to every grant in general. Um, that does not necessarily mean paper, especially in today's environment. You know, if that documentation is available electronically, then that is better in many ways. Um, monitoring of subrecipients. You know, if there's any subrecipients out there that are currently wrapping up their projects, you know, it would be a good uh, step before the end of the year to go in there and make sure that any outstanding issues have been cleared up there. If there's any reports or requests that need to be reviewed, or you know, if maybe they have some of their budget that hasn't been spent yet, uh, make sure to reach out and see if that's gonna be spent or if that can be kind of quickly repurposed to something else. And, and a, a common theme in auditing and grant accounting is document, document, document. Make sure that all of the documentation of reviews, reconciliations, monitoring, and uh, any other control activities performed for those funds is retained. That will become an important part of the information provided to the auditors when the time comes for that. And here's our second polling question, kind of coming in here fast at you. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. So I'm going to launch this one and read it. It, it, it asks, which of the following is an allowable use of coronavirus relief funds? Is it relief to businesses affected by the pandemic? Supplies for adapting to social distancing? Payroll for public safety personnel? Payroll for other positions directly related to COVID-19 response? Or is it all of the above? I'm gonna be a little bit, uh, give a little bit less time on this one. I think this is quite an easy one and uh, we need to keep things moving. So. Just uh, another few seconds here, please get your answers in to get your credit. 
I can see we've got most of the answers in. So last five seconds now. Okay, last chance, everyone. I'm gonna end the poll. And I will share the results. Gwen, do you wanna summarize those results? Well, pretty much everybody answered all of the above and that is correct. So good job, everybody. All right, so we're moving into discussion of the second program we'll be tackling today. This is the Education Stabilization Fund as it applied to K-12 schools. This was mostly awarded out in the year and the ESSER programs. Um, this was first awarded in the CARES Act as well. Um, GEAR was the Governor's Emergency Education Relief and ESSER was, I believe, the elementary, elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief, something like that. Um, that GEAR money was awarded through governor's offices who then passed it out to educational agencies in the states. And the ESSER went directly through the state edu educational agencies as much of the normal educational funding notes, such as Title I and Idea B and all of the other programs. Um, then the CRRSA from December of 2020 moved some funds out into a separate program for private schools. Prior to that, so in the portion that was awarded in the CARES Act, um, the, uh, the funds for private schools were included in the other programs and they had to be separately allocated out um, for expenses that private schools had incurred. But from December 2020 onward, that was a separate funding stream entirely. So the expenses here that were allowable were a little bit different because the states and the SEAs especially kind of put their own stamp on this funding for each different state. Um, we do work with several different state educational agencies a lot. And the requirements for using these funds, for reporting these funds, and instructions on how to record the use of those funds was extremely different in between states. Um, but the typical expense uses were generally pretty similar. So, you know, it could be used for salaries and benefits for educational staff, school support, um, administrators, school nurses, and bus drivers, um, payments to staff on leave due to closures or quarantine was specifically called out in the guidance as an allowable use. Now, typically, there's some pretty hefty uh, documentation requirements for using federal funds for folks who are on leave, but due to the circumstances here, you know, it's pretty much a blanket allowable use for these funds. Of course, supplies for sanitation, cleaning, social distancing, and PPE, especially as students moved back into classrooms. Again, that also happened at different times in every different state and sometimes in every different district. Um, technology and training for distance learning. You know, there were an awful lot of school districts that purchased Chromebooks and laptops for students to be able to log in to their Google Classroom or their Zoom classrooms as well as training for the teachers and administrators um, actually doing those classes. My husband actually works with students and it was quite an adjustment last year, to say the least. Um, upgrades to HVAC and similar systems, you know, improving ventilation, a lot of classrooms get stuffy. And in the pandemic, you didn't really want all of that um, recirculated air just kind of hanging out in there. So HVAC systems were an allowable use, as well as just general ventilation improvements. And as I mentioned before, under ESSER 1, funds to private schools for similar expenses were also awarded. 
on some best practices here as it relates to payroll. Now, the time and effort requirements that apply to federal programs such as Title I are extended to apply to the Education Stabilization Fund at school districts. So that does mean that time and effort records need to be maintained for staff as per usual. Um, and then, you know, if the state agency does allow reclassification of some of those personnel's costs to be used out of the Educational Stabilization Fund instead of their normal funding source, then that should be sufficient documentation there. So my advice there would be to just make sure that all staff, especially those working in schools and those working on multiple programs and in multiple areas do maintain time and effort documentation. Um, for staff on leave that are to be paid out of these funds, you know, just make sure that that's documented. You know, was there a school closure due to uh, COVID-19 exposure? Um, medical leave, those sorts of things. And for benefits associated with that payroll, they can be charged just as per normal to federal programs, um, as long as there's that link there between the salaries or wages that are paid and the directly associated benefits. Now, for non-payroll costs, you know, again, make sure that there's that supporting documentation. Um, and that that does include the nexus to the COVID response. So if it's a purchase of a bunch of laptops, then there should be something supporting that that was, those were handed out to students for online learning. Um, procurement, normal procurement rules do apply, um, including those that may fall under emergency and sole source procurements. Again, this is an area where the states are heavily involved and most states do have their own rules that are more restrictive than federal. So I would just encourage everybody to stay compliant with their own state's rules and their own policies and procedures there. And finally, for any equipment that costs over $5,000, for each item, those do need to be tracked and maintained, just like other federal items. Uh, this could be technology to be installed at school, such as additional servers, uh, maybe Wi-Fi capabilities, that sort of stuff, as well as those improvements to, say, an HVAC system. And we're on to another polling question. Thank you, Gwen. Here, I'm going to launch polling question number three and read it out. For the Education Stabilization Fund for the K-12 awards, which records would best support payroll charged to the grant? Would it be timesheets showing time and effort, a memo explaining that time is allocated by budgets, emails between staff members, or a general ledger detail? So I'll give everyone just a few questions, a few seconds here. You can really tell an auditor wrote this question. You know, auditors always hammering on about uh, supporting evidence, but uh, I say that in jest, but in jest, but in all seriousness, you know, obviously these awards were implemented quickly and the, pro the programs uh, didn't always have the time to, to get the support in, in place. And, and uh, that is gonna be looked at by the auditors. They're gonna want to see that support. So it is an important thing to, to have lined up. So um, yeah, auditors aren't always just being difficult. Sometimes there's, there's a necessity the, behind their requests, but uh, I, I'm going to give everyone the last couple of seconds. So it, just get your answer in. It doesn't have to be correct to get credit. Um, so last couple of moments, if you want to get it in, and I'm going to end the poll right now. I will share the results. And Gwen, how did everyone do? Well, the majority of people did say the timesheets showing time and effort, and that would be the best documentation out of these choices for sure. Of course, not all employees in a school do complete timesheets, but for those that do, that is the best documentation available.
All right, our next section here is still in the education realm, but it is the portion that went out to colleges and universities, H-E-E-R-F or HERF. Okay, so this was originally awarded in the CARES Act, that was HERF 1, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, awarded HERF 2, and the American Rescue Plan awarded HERF 3. The two main types of funding awarded out in all three of these were for student and institutional expenses. We'll get into, get into what those mean here momentarily, but those are two very different types of funding. Then there were some other awards handed out in these awards, in these acts, sorry. There were special allocations for historically black colleges and universities, um, tribally controlled colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. There were also some competitive grants and supplemental grants that in some cases universities had to apply for, whereas most of this funding was an automatic allocation to governmental, not-for-profit, and some portions did also go out to for-profit colleges and universities. Okay, so the student portion of HERF, this was only to be used for supplemental awards to students. This was awarded in all the three sections of HERF. Um, upon the issuance of HERF 2, there was a requirement to prioritize students with exceptional need. Now, what I have seen happen a lot here is either schools um, did use the same criteria for Pell Grants to award those same students with additional awards from HERF. Um, in some cases, there was also a application process for those awards. Typically not a very difficult application. Most times the student self-certifying that they have some indication of exceptional need could be maybe a student that became unemployed, is having financial difficulties, maybe needs assistance with childcare or similar expenses. Okay, so in HERF one, two, and three, most awards were 50% for the student portion and then 50% to the institutional portion. That institutional portion, any amount of that could have been used for additional awards to students. Um, it was also allowed to defray expenses related to the coronavirus. This was a very, very broad category. Okay. There were expenses related to the transition to distance education in the college classrooms as well. Um, I have seen that both with similar technology you know, getting your Zoom set up and making sure that all professors and students can access those. Also in some cases where that was really not practical, for example, uh, at a medical training college, you know, they did buy a bunch of additional equipment to be able to spread out the hands-on classes. So everybody had more space once things actually did open back up. Um, payroll was charged in a lot of cases. And then one of the other complications here with HERF is that both HERF and HERF 2 and HERF 3 changed the requirements somewhat. Before the issuance of HERF 3 in the American Rescue Plan Act, certain student support activities were allowed to be charged um, along with what is typically a student support activities in that environment could be stuff like tutoring um, and outreach to students to make sure that everything's going all right. And then starting with HERF 3, there was another category uh, where funds must be used to implement evidence-based practices to monitor and suppress the coronavirus. 
So that would be stuff like even just your temperature checks when coming into school. Um, and also conducting outreach to financial aid applications that may be eligible to get one of those student awards, but may not know that they are eligible. Um, and then lost revenue is a big topic here. That was not allowed under HERF 1. It came into existence with HERF 2. And we do have some information on that in a few slides. Okay, we mentioned earlier the other programs that were out there. The uses of those fundings were quite similar to those allowed for institutional funding, except that lost revenue started being allowable under those beginning with HERF 1. And then there's a supplemental award. Um, most cases, those required applications and the uses of those funds were specified within the award documents. Okay, there was also quite a bit of information on prohibited uses of the HERF funding. Uh, marketing and recruitment, that was a prohibited use. Um, endowments, certain capital outlays, um, the salaries and compensation for your most senior and executive employees. Um, as it relates to the for-profit colleges and universities, you know, really anything related to that profit motive here, your stock buybacks and dividends, uh, capital distributions and stock options were all prohibited. Um, costs of religious worship, instruction, proselytization, or equipment or supplies to be used for such were prohibited uses, and the construction or purchase of real property. However, that last bullet point, there is an exception for minor remodeling. Uh, there's the reference to the definition there, but I also have it here. Uh, that means... Sorry, I lost my slide. Okay. That means minor alterations in a previously completed building for purposes associated with the coronavirus. And this also includes the extension of utility lines, could be water or electricity, from points beyond the confines of the space in which the minor remodeling is undertaken, but within the confines of the previously completed building. It does not include building construction, structural alterations to buildings, building maintenance, or repairs. So given those limitations there, something that would be allowable here is again, HVAC and ventilation systems, including the installation of those in previously constructed buildings and all required utility hookups to get those things actually functioning. Um, also allowed is the lease of temporary modular or trailer classroom units that would increase social distancing and also the purchase and installation of room dividers to increase social distancing. Okay, lost revenue. This is definitely the most complicated part of HERF. So there are certain sources that are and are not allowed to be taken into account here. Academic sources of lost revenue are allowed, would include tuition fees and other charges, um, unpaid student AR and debts. I have seen several cases where HERF money was used to kind of repay the college and wipe out student debt. And lost revenue related to room and board is allowable. Um, any lost revenue that's directly related to enrollment declines that were caused by COVID-19. Note that that would not be enrollment declines that were actually caused by something else, such as existing plans to shutter a program or stop offering a certain degree. Any enrollment declines caused by that would have to be eliminated from this calculation. Uh, any decreases that were related to supported research, and any summer terms and camps, you know, it could be either summer semesters 
or of course some universities and colleges do have camps in the summer for high school students that did not occur um, or even for their own students that were canceled due to the pandemic. Um, auxiliary services sources, so those that may not be directly associated with the educational um, services of the entity. And canceled events, obviously there were a lot of those related to COVID-19. And also charges for the use of facilities or venues. For example, I've seen one recently where a college did count as lost revenue. Um, rental fees that they were no longer getting where they used to allow you, an organization to use one of their buildings for meetings on the weekend. Obviously those meetings stopped happening and so that revenue stream dried up for the college. Uh, other revenue streams that were affected, you know, food services, dormitory services beyond just the room and board, child care services if those centers had to close, bookstore costs and fees on parking, leases and royalties, and really just a broad category of other operating revenue. If there are any sources that could be questionable, but could fall into that other operating revenue source, I would encourage you to reach out to somebody who's working with these funds. Uh, there are some non-reimbursable sources that are specifically laid out in the guidance as well. Capital funds associated with athletic facilities. Note that this is not the same as admission to athletic events, for example. Let's say if the school expected to be awarded some capital funds to expand a stadium, and after COVID that award did not happen, that is not an allowable lost revenue use. And the funds for acquisition of real property, if bonds were expected to be issued, but then were not, and those bonds were for acquisition of real property, that's not a lost revenue for purposes of this funding. Contributions and donations, you know, decreases in that cannot be used in this calculation. Any decreases related to marketing or recruitment activities, revenues related to sectarian instruction or religious worship, alcohol sales and investment income. So how does this actually work? So in performing, in gathering the information to perform this calculation, um, the revenue reductions that are to be used must be related to COVID-19. As I mentioned, if there were changes that were planned prior to March of 2020, any resulting lost revenues from those would not be allowed in the calculation. Lost revenue is charged to the grant at the end of the period used to estimate lost revenue. I believe that April will be going into the accounting treatment of lost revenue in a little bit more depth later. Um, but just be aware that this will show up on your CIFA as of a specific date, and it is not associated with specific costs. So it's not like you're going through and picking out costs to charge to this grant. You're really just recording the lost revenue and recording revenue to make up for that lost revenue as part of the HERF program. And one more important thing to note is you cannot double dip with these funds. Any institutions that may have received the provider relief fund and had lost revenues to be charged against that, then you cannot also use those same lost revenues for HERF purposes. And then there is this item about not including any refunds previously provided to students. Um, an example here. So for instance, if tuition had decreased by $2 million when you're looking at FY 2020 versus FY 2019, However, HERF 1 
used $500,000 to actually make refunds to students. And that $500,000 made up some of that 2 million, then the allowable decrease in tuition to be used for the lost revenue calculation would be 1.5 million, not 2 million. Now, finally, how is this calculation actually performed? So one of the FAQs issued by the Department of Education shows several different methods of calculation. Whichever one of these methods is the most advantageous to your organization, just use that one. You don't have to justify that. But here are the methods to pick from. A simple year over year comparison to prior year. Okay, a semester over semester comparison. So, you know, compare fall of 2020 to fall of 2019, compare spring of 2021 to spring of 2020, uh, depending on when COVID impacts happened, of course. Comparison to a three or five year combined average revenue. So you would calculate that average and use that as a baseline a comparison to a previously budgeted or projected amount of revenue, comparison with a baseline year of a fiscal year that ended prior to March 13th, 2020. And it is important to note that whatever method is used, the information used must be accorded consistent treatment and measure baseline revenue and lost revenue consistently. Now, when I have seen this in practice, uh, I think the most common method that I have seen used so far is comparison to a three or five year combined average revenue. It kind of smooths out any effects of local economic conditions or other items in the past few years leading up to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I've also seen this calculation being performed on each revenue stream separately. Then, of course, you can't really pick and choose which of the allowable revenue streams um, to include. And you can to some extent, but just be very careful with the documentation um, to make sure that you are proving that you're recording everything consistent treatment. If you're using a three-year average for decreases in tuition, you would also need to use that in decreases for bookstore revenue, for example. Okay, we're up to another polling question. Thank you, Gwen. I'm gonna go ahead and launch oh, the, uh, the fourth polling question. And I'll read it out. The, the question four asks, which is an acceptable method for calculating lost revenue for HERF? Is it a year over year comparison to prior year, semester over semester comparison to the matching prior year semester, comparison to a three or five year combined average revenue as the baseline, comparison to previously budgeted or projected revenue versus the actual, or is it all of the above? So I'm gonna give everyone just a few moments here. I think this is a fairly easy one, but remember everyone, you need to get your answer in to get credit. You don't need to get it correct, but you do need to answer for your credit. I can see that we're mostly complete. Most, of, most people have answered. So just another five seconds. Okay, last chance to get your answers in. Going once, going twice. There we go, I've ended the poll and I'm sharing the results. Gwen, how did everybody do? Everybody did pretty well. 85% said all of the above and that is correct. Okay, so we do have some best practices here to finish up our section on the HERF. Um, for student payments, starting with HERF 2 and 3, it uh, does need to be documented which students have exceptional need. Uh, as I stated before, 
Pell Grant recipients is kind of a common shorthand to determine who has exceptional need, but other criteria may also be used. Just make sure that that policy is updated and is also publicly posted. Information related to the payments actually made to students is also required to be periodically posted to the institution's website. Um, for lost revenue, make sure that you have documentation supporting all inputs used to that calculation. Could include budgets, projections, and the underlying data. Um, once that calculation is prepared, make sure that review of that calculation um, is documented. Uh, this could also include, say, presentation to the board of directors or similar governing body. And again, make sure that all supporting documentation has also been reviewed as part of this calculation. I would also highly suggest preparation of a memo that explains the rationale, the calculation, the methodology used, and the assumptions made. As part of that memo, I would also focus on the concept of reperformability. Now, this is often more of an auditor side concept than an auditee side concept. Um, but that means that it is, it is important to consider when it comes to preparing for your audit. In a case like this, where we are dealing with multiple reports that have been pulled from software, for example, you need to make sure that somebody else coming behind you could repull the reports used in that calculation, could find those same numbers and could come up with the same conclusion given the same inputs. So that could be as simple as making sure that the reports that you've pulled from the system are named like they are when they come out of the system or that you have documented instructions and process on how to get to that information. Okay, next we're coming up to April section, starting with accounting treatments. So April, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you, Gwen. That was, that was uh, absolutely interesting information. Thanks for sharing it with us. Um, so I'm going to move on into the very exciting world of accounting for these things. Um, so the first thing we wanna think about is when we uh, look at the coronavirus relief fund, is it even a grant? Well, the treasury decided to actually call it other financial assistance, not a grant. Um, so, uh, you know, we think, yay, we're done. We don't have to worry about this anymore, but no, unfortunately, um, GASB says we really need to look at the substance of the transaction, not the form. And uh, the fact that it's called other financial assistance really makes no difference. Um, interestingly enough, it makes very little difference in our single audit rules as well. So if one wanted to just think of it as a grant, you'd be uh, very well served. Um, uh, a little background, they actually... Um, did it as other financial assistance to some degree based on a report that their own internal auditors came out with. Um, they classified it as other financial assistance so that they wouldn't have to do things like grant award documentation um, uh, between the treasury and the um, prime recipients because of that really need to get the funding out so quickly. Um, they had a lot more flexibility by calling it other financial assistance. So it doesn't really matter a lot that it's called that. Don't let that get you off track. Um, so GASB 33 says we have to look at the substance. It, it, it acts like a grant. Um, we also know that there were some eligibility requirements here um, for it, that, that, that recipients were able to accept or reject it. And so the real classification of this in our GASB 33 land, um, and we'll go through these classifications in a later slide, is that we're gonna consider our CRF money as a voluntary non-exchange transaction that has some eligibility requirements. And that's gonna be very important because we're gonna learn that the difference between eligibility requirements and purpose restrictions is gonna drive a lot of when we can recognize this revenue. And we are gonna move straight into a poll question. Thank you, April. Polling question number five, let me launch that here. And question five asks, coronavirus relief fund is properly treated as is it other financial assistance, a voluntary non-exchange transaction, 
Is it free money without restrictions? That would be nice. Or is it both A and B? So a little bit of a tricky one here, April, you've thrown, thrown everybody, but uh, let's see how people do. Yes, as Rob, as Rob and uh, I think uh, one of our other partners like to point out, I actually teach uh, a couple of college classes on governmental accounting. And so they say I'm a very hard question writer because of <laughs> being a college, <laughs> college professor. You certainly are. You certainly are. But we're getting some good responses here. I can see the results coming in. I'm just going to give everyone five more seconds. So get your answers in to get your credit. And remember, you don't have to get it right. So just answer a question. Well said, well said. So going once, going twice. I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. April, how did everyone do? Uh, yeah, so pretty well. Uh, the answer is A and B. It is technically other financial assistance and it is also a voluntary non-exchange transaction. Um, I'm glad I, I see that. I think we only had one person who maybe was a super funny person who picked uh, C, free money without restrictions. So yes, let's please not turn it, let's not treat it that way. Um, but yes, it is. we want to really think about this as a voluntary non-exchange transaction. All right. And so when, why does that matter? Well, GASB 33 is what really drives how we're going to recognize um, uh, grant revenue in local governments. And it gives us a list of four different types of transactions um, when we're looking at non-exchange. So if you, if you recall back in your, um, you know, government 101, an exchange transaction is one where you're really exchanging goods or services for something of equal value, right? You're selling utilities, uh, ut electric service to a customer. Um, someone's paying you money to come and swim in your pool um, as a government, not personally, probably. And uh, that's going to be your exchange transaction. Well, GASB 33 talks a lot about non-exchange and non-exchange transactions are the type of revenues that governments primarily get where um, the money is coming in, but the um, person paying is not necessarily getting something of equal value in exchange. Um, and so the some of the ones that um, we have are a derived tax revenue. So that's when someone has to basically pay a tax that's derived on another transaction. So I have a sales tax. Um, if I decide I want to buy a new car, I am going to on that transaction have to pay some percentage that's derived from the cost of the transaction as a tax. Okay, so this is clearly not that. Then we have the imposed non-exchange revenues. They're not transactional based. They, they're still tax kind of things, but it's not as based on a transaction. And so you have property tax is your classic example of that. Whether you buy or sell your house in the year, it doesn't matter. The, the sheer uh, fact that you own a house in a certain jurisdiction, you'll be paying some kind of taxes on that. And it's imposed. You don't have a choice. Um, generally, if you want to keep your house, you have to pay the tax. Um, so again, not any of this funding doesn't apply to that. And then we come down to these bottom two. The bottom two have very specific accounting um, guidance for them that is really uh, covers both of them. Now, government mandated non-exchange transaction is basically when you get a higher level of government that says, hey, we really want you to do this program. We're gonna give you the money and you don't have a choice. A lot of school districts get this kind of money from their states um, that they may not have a choice about whether they want to offer Title I. Uh, they don't have a, you know, they don't get a choice. You're gonna give you the money. We're giving it to you, it's non-exchange, but it's not one that you can choose to take or leave. You must accept it. Um, your higher level of government requires it. Same accounting for that as this last bucket, the voluntary non-exchange transaction, which is where CRF falls. Um, and that's where most of your grants and donations are gonna fall. And so it's, it's a non-exchange um, when the federal government gave this money out to states and the large primary recipients. Um, they didn't, you know, nothing had to be given back to them in, in, in exchange value. It's a non-exchange transaction and it's voluntary. The governments could choose to not spend the money. They could choose to return the money or just not even accept it from the federal government or any kind of uh, subrecipient relationship they may have had. And so when we talked about how is it classified, that, that's what drives it to be this voluntary non-exchange transaction, which is now how we can continue to go forward and see how do I actually account for that. Now I know what it is, how am I going to account for it? Okay, so when we're in uh, the voluntary non-exchange transaction um, category, GASB gives us a lot of guidance on how we can account for it. Um, some more things we're going to need to know once, once we know what it is. 
is we're going to have to understand that um, we know, we, uh, we already talked a little bit about when gave us some detail on how the money can be spent, that the, the federal, the treasury came in and said, this is how you can spend it and how you can't spend it. If you're a subrecipient, you may have gotten additional restrictions placed by the state or your higher level of local government who shared the funds with you. And so when, you're, when I'm being told, here's how I'm allowed to spend the money, it feels like a purpose restriction, right? I'm being given this money and I have to use it on a thing. Well, this is where GASB's, GASB 33 can get a little confusing because it's kind of a purpose restriction, but it's really an expenditure driven basis. And I know when I first tried to learn GASB 33, when it came out, um, I can't believe it's been so long. Um, you know, this, this one really drove me nuts. And I, I you know, understanding how is that a, uh, not a purpose restriction um, when you're telling me what I'm allowed to spend it on. And GASB's, um, really the way I think they intended GASB 33 to be is that these purpose restrictions are only, um, th these restrictions on the spending are only defined as purpose restrictions, which are not going to affect when I record the revenue. When it's some kind of entitlement grant, I'm being given the money. Um, it's, it's not based on how much I spend. Um, so if you think FTE money that a school gets from the state, I'm being given the money, I have some restrictions on how I can spend it, but I'm not getting it based on um, specific spending, right? It's, it's, it's not an expenditure driven grant. The basis of the grant is that I'm getting this money based on some other metric and, and entitlement grants are, are your most common ones. Um, and so if I've got a purpose restriction on an entitlement grant, um, you know, spending restriction, I have to spend on these specific items to, due to my grantor, but I'm getting the money based on a uh, number of students, number of road miles, something like that, that's going to be a purpose restriction. And it is not going to actually impact when I recognize the revenue for my non-exchange transaction. This other kind of restriction on how I spend it, which is really what we have in CRF, and it's the most common thing we have in grants, is, is, is um, really considered to be part of something called an expenditure-driven basis. Um, and so I may have some restrictions on how I spend it, um, but my actual reimbursement is going to be, or advance that I get to keep, is going to be entirely based on how much I spend on these allowable costs, right? And so that is becomes an eligibility requirement. And so when we look at our different eligibility requirements, which do affect when we can recognize the revenue, we cannot recognize revenue until we've met our eligibility requirements. We've got things like the characteristics of the recipient. If you have to be a local government with population of under 100,000 people, well, you really need that to be able to do this. Um, Gwen, can you go back a slide, please? Thank you. Um, and so if, if I don't have those characteristics, I shouldn't have gotten the money in the first place, but I certainly shouldn't recognize the revenue. The time requirements, that's telling me um, if I can't spend that money until January 1st, I'm not going to be able to recognize the money, the revenue until January 1st hits. Um, and then finally, we, you know, we kind of um, circling back to this, is that concept of the expenditure driven basis. If we haven't incurred allowable costs on an expenditure driven basis grant, then we can't recognize the revenue. And so I think the real key thing here is to really understand in any grant you have, um, whether or not a restriction on how you spend the money is classified as a purpose restriction only, or whether or not the grant itself is expenditure driven. And those purpose restrictions, th those restrictions on how you spend the money are impactful but um, on, on how you're going to spend the money, but what the driver is of revenue recognition is spending the money. Where with a purpose restriction, which is generally on a non on an on a um, entitlement-based grant, um, those purpose restrictions don't. And so one example here would um, I think that that could be interesting, especially for um, uh, in the state of Florida, we have uh, ship grants, which are a housing grant. Um, and uh, states get a certain amount of, I mean, anybody who's a recipient gets a certain amount of money. Um, I've never understood for the life of me why we booked that revenue when we got it. <laughs> you know, in all other grant revenues, we book almost all of the grant revenues. In my experience, we would book 
the revenue as we spent the funds, right? Um, and it's because it's considered entitlement by the state of Florida. And I'm sure every other state has got different um, specifics and how they define the grants. Um, but if, if, if I were to have a grant that were not an entitlement, same exact rules, same exact everything else, this grant is based on your population and you get a certain number of dollars per people in your city um, versus this grant is based on your proposed spending right? Everything else about the grant can be the same. Your revenue recognition can be entirely different. Um, if it's only a purpose restriction and not an expenditure-driven grant, you can recognize the revenue when those other eligibility requirements are met and you've received the funds. Um, if it is a expenditure-driven grant, you really have to spend the funds as an eligibility requirement before you recognize the revenue. And I know it can be really easy to get tangled up in this, um, which is why I think I'm spending so much time explaining this slide, because at least for my um, uh, slow self, it definitely was somewhere where I got twisted around a lot. This was probably the part of GASB 33 that took me the longest to really figure out. Okay, thanks, Gwen. All right, so when do I get to recognize my revenue? In general, when we're looking at those bottom two categories in GASB 33, government mandate and a voluntary non-exchange. I, al I always, I tell this to my governmental accounting classes, cash is cash. When you get the cash, you have to book it. <laughs> you know, you have to book the cash as cash. Um, so you book the asset, either cash or receivable, when one of the two things happen. And, and it is, we have received the resources. So if we get cash, we're certainly going to book cash. Um, there's our debit. Or we can go ahead and book a receivable if all applicable eligibility requirements are met. And remember for an expenditure driven grant, one of those eligibility requirements is that you spent the funds. So if you spent the funds or if you've gotten the money in, you can go ahead and book your debit, book your cash or your receivable depending on which is met. Now on the revenue side, we have to have met all of our applicable eligibility requirements. And again, for a um, expenditure driven grant where your, where your reimbursement or the amount of the advance you're allowed to keep is, is determined by how much you spend on eligible things, you that is one of your eligibility requirements. And so basically you're gonna recognize that revenue as you spend the funds, as long as the other eligibility requirements are met, including timing and uh, any other contingencies they put on there. One tricky part here um, is to, um, if, it, if it is an actual reimbursement grant where they're going to pay you after you do a draw, and there are parts of the CRF that came in as a reimbursement even for prime recipients, if you received it through your state or through a higher level of local government as a subrecipient, um, in almost all cases, um, there, there was some portion that was a reimbursement and not an advance. So if you're getting this on a reimbursement basis, you also have to look at when the funds eventually come in. Um, and make sure it's within your period of availability because if it's not in your if it's not available received within 60 days or 90 whatever your definition of availability is in your ent entity um, then in our modified accrual funds we're not going to be able to book that revenue until um, until the next fiscal year so uh, and we'll have a reconciling item between our government wide and our governmental fund financials and so we, we want to book that revenue in the modified accrual fund statements when we've met all the applicable eligibility requirements, including spending the funds on an allowable cost and the resources are available. For our government-wide statements, we don't worry about availability. So this is just really kind of hitting that again. We recognize the revenues and the receivables if it's a reimbursement base as allowable costs once we've spent them, right? Once we've actually spent the funds. Um, and we can't qualify as eligible. It's an eligibility requirement to spend the funds on allowable costs. And so we wonder, what, how, how is CRF? You know, is, it, is this an entitlement grant? Is this a reimbursement grant, right? You know, I mean, I, I think when we first started getting these funds in, nobody really knew um, exactly how we would do this because it felt a little entitlement-y, like, hey, we're going to give you a certain amount. And it's not, you know, you didn't actually like you know, say that here's my plans on what I'm going to spend, and this is what I would like to get. It was just kind of allocated out, um, both by the prime um, to the prime recipients from the federal government and to the subrecipients by most states.
Now, what about when we have an advance? Um, so when we think of expenditure driven grants, we typically um, kind of shorthand is often cost reimbursement grant, right? That's, that's a, what a lot of the language we use is it's cost reimbursement grant. That in a lot of people's minds, that's the same thing as an expenditure driven grant, but we can have expenditure driven grants where we get advances. And how do we handle that when that happens? Um, we are gonna go ahead on the revenue side um, other than the fact that we don't have to worry about uh, the, the availability issue because we already got the money up front. Um, on the revenue side, we're gonna treat it just as if it were a cost reimbursement grant, right? As we spend the money, we book the revenue. Um, we don't have a receivable, we have cash, right? When we get the cash up front before we spend anything, we cannot book that revenue um, because we haven't spent it. We haven't met that eligibility requirement. Um, so what we're going to end up doing is we're going to have our debit to cash and our credit is going to be to the liability unearned revenue. Um, and we're going to keep that in balance to be basically the amount that we haven't spent yet. Until we've spent it, we cannot book it as revenue. As we spend it um, in our, during the allowable period of performance, as we incur those allowable costs, then what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to debit that liability, that unearned revenue liability, and go ahead and credit revenue as we go along. So we, we can't go ahead, we can't book the revenue just because we got the cash. The revenue booking is really, in most cases, assuming all the other eligibility requirements like period of performance are met, that uh, revenue booking is really tied to the expenditure of the funds, regardless of whether it's an advance or a reimbursement basis, it's that expenditure driven basis, which we often confuse with reimbursement basis, but they're very different. What happened with CRF funding? How, how are we doing it? What, what should we have done? What are we doing? Did I do it right? Um, in a lot of cases, phase one and phase two funding was provided as an advance. Um, and so we are like, hey, is this, is this uh, an entitlement kind of grant or is this an expenditure driven grant? Well, the, what we got from the treasury for any of you with experience with this, we didn't get much. It was pretty vague, some Q and A's, the statutory language was, uh, or the legislative language was incredibly limited. So GASB actually uh, saved the day, came in on their little horse and said, no, no, we, we, we understand. There's not enough guidance here, so we are going to help. And so GASB's put out a technical bulletin, 2020-1, and it, said, it, it clarified. It said, yeah, we have, we have decreed, uh, we as the GASB have decreed, this is not an entitlement grant. This is um, a, a expenditure-driven grant where that incurrence, incurrence of the eligible expenditures is an eligibility requirement, not a purpose requirement. And so Gasby came in, clarified it and said, yeah, we know this one's weird. So, you know, we don't usually do this, but this one's real weird. So we're gonna go ahead and tell you. So everybody does it the same and we don't have to reinvent the wheel for every um, financial um, statement user and, and auditor. This uh, is not, an entitlement grant. This is a um, eligible, I mean, this is a uh, expenditure driven grant, regardless of whether you're getting an advance or cost reimbursement. And so we follow the guidance we just talked about that when I get the advance until I spend it, it's going to be a liability of unearned revenue. As I spend the money down, as long as all other eligibility requirements are met, then I can book my revenue and reduce that unearned revenue liability. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. It's, it's a you know, GASB 33 in general, and then clarified down to how are we doing it for CRF accounting. On a reimbursement basis, it's very similar and really basically how you would do most of your uh, uh, grants in, in most cases. If you're getting it on a reimbursement basis, it doesn't draw, it doesn't really change that revenue recognition except for the period of availability because you may not get your reimbursement within your window of availability. But as I make my eligible expenditures up to the amount awarded, I can go ahead and book a receivable with an offsetting uh, revenue. And then I would, I may have to have a deferred inflow if my period of availability is not met for the eventual reimbursement of the funds. And we move to a poll question. Thank you, April. We've actually got two polling questions here coming back to back. So here's the first one being launched right now. This one asks, CRF funds should be reported as revenue in the government wide statements when, is it received but not spent, received and expended, the award is made from the grantor, or is it all of the above? 
You've been a little bit tricky again, April, with these questions, throwing a, a tricky all of the above option in there. That's a, that's classic April. <laughs> so we've got um, a few more people still to answer. So 10 more seconds here. Let's Let's try and get these answers in and keep moving. Try not to get tricked by April's uh, options. Last couple of seconds, get your answers in to get, get your CPE credit. Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm gonna end it there. And I'm gonna share the results of April before we do the next question. How did everyone do? Um, pretty well. So 55% of you said received and expended, and that is correct. Uh, we cannot recognize that revenue as a cost, I mean, as a um, expenditure driven grant, which Gasby told us it is. We can't uh, recognize it just when we receive it, but we haven't spent it yet. Uh, and we definitely can't recognize it when the award has just been made. Um, we, we can only recognize it really it's tied to the expenditure um, as an expenditure driven grant, regardless of whether we get it as an advance or cost reimbursement. And I liked your trick there, you know, all of the above is going to draw people's attention and, and uh, but, but that wasn't the case that time. So here's the next question, number seven. This one asks, availability of the funding impacts revenue recognition. Is it in the government wide statements? in the governmental fund statements, in the proprietary fund statements, or is it none of the above? So give everyone a few moments here. This is a tricky one as well. Um, let's see what everyone, everyone thinks. Answers are coming a little bit more slowly for this one. I understand that it, this is a tricky one, but uh, I'm going to give it 10 more seconds and then, then we'll get, uh, get the results. Okay, last couple of moments to get your answers in, to get your credit. Going once. Going twice. Okay, I'm going to end the poll there. And share the results. April, how did everybody do? We had it all over the place for this one, but barely squeaking out a win was the correct answer in the governmental fund statements. So yes, availability only impacts revenue recognition in our governmental fund statements. It's a modified accrual concept. All right, moving on. If I've given my money, I uh, got my CRF money and I'm passing it through to another entity, um, I'm, I'm passing it down. Uh, I'm not giving it directly to um, uh, an individual, I'm not spending it directly, I'm passing it on. I've got to figure out if that entity is a subrecipient. Now we're going to hit it a few times here. Um, if we have a subrecipient, now you, if you've given the money to someone who is properly classified as a subrecipient, you have now triggered a subrecipient monitoring um, uh, um, uh, compliance requirement. And so it's very important to know whether you're giving this money to someone classified as a recipient or a vendor or a subrecipient. Um, if I've given it to a subrecipient, that idea of what when is my expenditure driven, uh, expense driven eligibility requirement, when have I spent the funds? Is it when I spend the funds and give it, say, to a city under my county? Or is it when they use the money on something eligible? And Gasby says that uh, you've met that expense driven eligibility requirement when you pass it on to a subrecipient as of the time you pass it on to the subrecipient. Even if you're giving it to them on an advance basis and they're paying it out later, you don't have to wait for them to spend the funds. And um, Similarly, say they spend the funds in one fiscal year and you reimburse them in, in a next fiscal year, the time that the fact that they spent the money in it before you gave it to them also doesn't impact your recognition of that revenue. It's when you give them the money, not when they spend it. For lost revenue, when we have lost revenue, does that change the accounting? Yes, it's very different when you're doing the accounting for the, uh, the lost revenue. And so really, uh, you're, you're booking it whenever your other eligibility requirements are met. And so it's not tied to any specific expenditure. It's tied 
um, to the actions that resulted in the loss of revenue. So, um, you know, and, and if, if say you get it, uh, a lost revenue in one fiscal year and you don't get awarded this till two fiscal years later, um, you know, obviously you're not going to reopen two fiscal years ago. You have to actually have been awarded the funds. That's another eligibility requirement. And so if you got the funds awarded and you had already lost that revenue, you're good to go with any of your eligibility requirements. Uh, when they're all met, you go ahead and recognize the revenue. It's not expenditure driven grant at that point. All right, so what we saw is a lot in CRF. We're not seeing it quite as much in our ARPA or our um, some in the ERAP money that we're getting. Um, but what about when new guidance is issued? We know sometimes the treasury says, yeah, yeah, you can't use it on this. Oh, wait, no, you can, sorry, changed my mind. Oh, wait, no, you can't anymore, right? We, we've seen lots of that shifting around with, CARE, with the CRF under CARES Act for sure. Um, GASB was uh, actually pretty clear on this as well. This came down from the GASB with, uh, to say that, yeah, when that happens, we only consider its impact on when we can recognize that revenue um, during the fiscal year when that uh, change in guidance from the Treasury is enacted or issued. So you do not have to go back and make changes. Um, say your fiscal year ends September 30th, something happens on October 5th, you haven't really issued your financials yet, you still you don't you don't go back and, and fix your financials. Your, your, your financials are going to represent the revenue recognition based on the eligibility requirements that were in place on the date of your financial statements. You may, however, have to go in and use GASB 56, which is going to tell you um, how you handle subsequent events that are not that do not um, change the numbers on your financials, but you may have to disclose. So if it's, if it's material, if it's a significant change, um, you may have to disclose it if that happens prior to the issuance of your financial statements, but you do not go back and readjust your numbers on your actual revenue recognition. And another question we got a lot of, and Gasby came in and, and gave us some clarity on this, they really did a great job with understanding that we needed something on, on CRF. When we have expenditures, expenses, or even the revenues that are coming in related to the pandemic, aren't they extraordinary or special items? I mean, to me, it kind of feels extraordinary. Gatsby's like, nah, we think we're going to get lots of these things. Uh, so no, it's, it's not, they, they think it's not infrequent, which is kind of horrifying, um, but uh, they have not been wrong yet. So they said, nah, it's not infrequent. Um, and clearly uh, the pandemic was, as far as we know, not in control of management of any of our governments. And so it's not a special item either. So these are not to be recorded as extraordinary or special items, even if they kind of feel like they are. All right, Rob, you're up. Thank you, April. So let's do polling question number eight, launching that now. And that one asks, pandemic revenues and expenses may be reported as, is it an extraordinary item, a special item, both of the above or none of the above? So hopefully everyone was tuned in to the last slide and uh, we should have good answers for this question. Coming in, answers are coming in fairly quickly, so I'm just gonna give it five more seconds here. Please get your answers in for your credit. So wrapping up here, going once, going twice, ending the poll and sharing the results. April, how did everyone do? Very well. Yes, that is absolutely correct. It should be none of the above. They should not be an extraordinary or a special item. So good job, everyone. Okay, so we are shifting gears now to our single audit requirements and pitfalls. Single audit requirements uh, haven't changed. 750,000 or more of expenditures within your fiscal year of federal assistance or awards. Um, you have to have a single audit. You may be able to have just a program specific audit under some circumstances, especially if you don't get a lot of grants. But for most entities, this is just going to be part of their normal single audit that they have. And it could trip you into a single audit category if you haven't had it in the past. So be aware of that. Next slide. 
So what is a single audit? In a single audit, the federal government says, yeah, if you spent more than 750,000 of our money uh, in assistance or awards in one year, you must have this done. It's going to include a financial statement audit. And you'll have to have a schedule of those federal awards and assistance. That's called a CIFA in our vernacular. You're going to have to have that audit of your financial statements done under the yellow book rules, under government auditing standards, which is going to not just look to see if the numbers are right, but do you have good controls in place over those numbers and are you in compliance with laws, rules, regulations, and grants? And then the actual single audit is under something called uniform guidance. It's going to be um, when your auditors are going to come in and, and look at, at, at one or more of your uh, larger generally grants and really go do a deep dive into all the compliance requirements around that grant and your controls over those compliance requirements. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty thorough look at are you doing the right things with your grants and do you have the controls in place to make sure of that. All right, poll question. We have lots of them. Thank you, April. Let me go ahead and launch polling question number nine. There we go, should be launched now. And that one reads, because CRF is other financial assistance and not a grant, it is, re it is not reported on the CIFA. A single audit is not required for it. None of the above, I'm sorry, both of the above, or the last option is none of the above. So, so this one, I, I gave you the hint at the beginning, not <laughs> recently, but let's see who was listening at the beginning. Yeah, this one's a memory test. So we've got pretty good responses coming in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give it uh, about five more seconds. Okay, wrapping up here then, going once. Going twice, and I am ending the poll there. And sharing the results, April, how did everyone do? Um, awesome. You guys almost all got it correct. None of the above. It is going to be on the CIFA, and it does require a single audit. So great job. All right, moving on. Pitfalls. Where can we go wrong? What are we seeing from the auditor side for where we can go wrong? If you do not normally have a lot of federal grants and you don't normally have a single audit, you may not know that you need to do this or you may your auditors may not think about it. Um, and so please make sure that you really consider, am I subject to a single audit? Because you don't wanna find out you should have had one in the past. So just be real careful that you've identified it all and you're working with your auditors. Not being prepared for that single audit, again, especially if it's not something you're used to. Uh, if you don't have your records organized, if you don't have um, program staff, you know, you've got people off for that month. Um, and there, there's a lot of back and forth between your auditors, your staff, and your management on how a single audit works. It really is its own little nasty um, beast of an entity that um, requires a lot of extra work. So being prepared is very important to um, getting it out on time and not having a lot of findings. Control weaknesses, lack of documentation. This is something that um, you know can happen to any anywhere, but it's really uh, extra challenging when we look at CRF and some of this other pandemic relief and response funding, because things were rushed. There was a lot of pressure to get this money out fast. There was needs in the community. People's utility bills were being turned turned off. Businesses were shutting down. Right. There was a lot of pressure to spend the funds, and not a lot of guidance. At the same time, you had uh, many offices were shutting down and saying, go work from home, figure it out. Um, people were out ill. Um, people were on leave to take care of ill family members. And so your control processes may have changed dramatically. Um, and, and did we get those controls documented? Are there emails saying that Susie can approve instead of Jennifer because Jennifer's in the hospital, right? Um, how is that documented? Or was it like, we just have to get this money out the door? Um, so we definitely had some unique challenges with this, uh, with some of the pandemic funding. And then inconsistent document retention. Again, when we, when we transitioned overnight to remote work, uh, if, you're, if your entity was used to moving paper around with stamps and, you know, hand, hand initials and signatures, how did you 
handle that transition? And is it well documented? Um, did we transition to electronic records all of a sudden and, and not really think about how we were doing it with that focus on just getting the money out the door? And not only the records, but then those reviews of the records and the reconciliations. Maybe somebody did check it, but because it was electronic and not paper, there's no proof that they did. So we definitely saw some extra special challenges um, around this funding as it came out. So how do I get ready for my single audit? How do I avoid some of these pitfalls? Well, definitely talk to your auditors in advance. Say, hey, have you guys considered this? We're not sure. Can you help us figure out if, if we're going to be subject to this? When the auditors ask for things, um, you know, it can, it can drag a, a two-week process out to three months if the program staff are all on vacation, have other priorities. So, you know, it can impact the timing of your, of your audits and your financial statements. The more you can have ready in a neat and tidy container for your auditors, the better, whether that's physical or um, electronically. Um, and getting that draft CIFA, at least at least being able to start it, say, here's what we think our grants are, and here's what we think we spent. Um, some states have a, a state requirement as well, but this is specifically federal. And then finally, look at your procedures and policies, your controls. And if things change during uh, the pandemic, uh, remote work, people being out, um, make sure that that's, that's been updated. Uh, it's, not, it's not your top priority when we're trying to respond to a I would hope once in a lifetime situation, um, but it, it's something that you may need to go back and clean up after the fact, but before your audit. So, so please make sure that those, you do not want to give your auditors policies and procedures that don't reflect what they're going to see in the records. If something changed, make sure you've documented that. Getting all that documentation into a tidy thing, this I can't tell you how easy it is. And um, as, as I've worked both sides of the house, I've been audited uh, for uh, over a decade and I've been an auditor for getting close to a decade. Um, so, you know, both sides of the house, I, I, I know this experience. And as an auditee, I always, uh, I always said like, uh, drown your auditors in paperwork. Don't, you know, don't tell them I said that, but, you know, give them everything, get it all tidy, get it ready. The more you can give them and the less they have to ask you, the faster it'll be. Um, and the less likely you really are going to be to have some findings, getting it all nice and tidy, ready to go. Um, and then the, the real cheat is look at the requirements of your grant. You can look on um, online under the uniform guidance and look at the compliance supplement. What does it say they're going to look at? It tells you what your auditors are going to look at. Make sure you have that ready for them. And it's going to make everything so much happier. And the real key thing is I say, take credit for your work. If you are doing reviews, if you have controls in place, Jennifer always reviews this report before Susie submits it. If Jennifer has not sent an email saying she reviewed it, if she has not initialed the document, if she has not done an electronic approval in a system, if there's no documentation she did it, you don't get credit for it, unfortunately. Um, so take credit for your work. If you're doing reviews, if you have controls in place, just make sure there's some documentation of that, even if it's as simple as an email um, saying, yes, I have reviewed this, you're authorized to submit it. And then this one I think is, is really awesome if you have the capacity and time to do it. And that's doing, a, if you know that you've got a huge CRF um, grant and it's way dwarfs all your other grants, you know your auditors are gonna look at it. So go ahead and do a pre-audit. Uh, get that compliance supplement out. Get your general ledger and reconcile it to the CIFA. Um, money got moved from one account to another constantly with most of our clients with the CRF as guidance came out and changed. Um, you know, it was like, oh, these are going to be CARES Act funds, uh, CRF Act funded. Oh, wait, no, now they said we can just use public safety. Oh, we're shifting all of that just because it's easier, right? So make sure that, that all that happened in your ledger and that it ties out nice and tidy, especially by fiscal year. If, if you had uh, multiple fiscal years to spend this money, you need to be able to very clearly show your auditors, I've got 12 million in spending on my CIFA. Here's a general ledger that shows where I spent that 12 million in the different programs for CRF, right? Um, at the end of the day, you need to be able to tie that out. And if you were moving money around from account to account through journal entries, you're going to need the detail that supports those journal entries. Spot check your documentation. See if you've got missing control documentation. Um, you know, fixing it after the auditors ask about it is not going to get you any credit. Having, having a 
uh, documentation that you recognize that that step got missed and it's because Jennifer was in the hospital, but you, you, you found it, you addressed it, you're going to have a little better chance of um, getting a cleaner audit. And then make sure you know your subrecipients. If, if, if you're not sure, ask your auditors. We're here to help. If you're like, I don't know if this is a subrecipient or a vendor, check with your auditors, um, you know, check with uh, with your, your grantor and um, you know, do a little research. And if it is a subrecipient, make sure you do some monitoring of that subrecipient, that they spent the funds appropriately and that you document that you did it. Um, and if you do see some issues, um, go ahead and figure out how, how is this, is this a one-off? Is it just that one week that so-and-so so was out? Or is it a persistent problem? And, and document what you've done to fix it. All of those things, doing it before your auditors find it, is going to put you in a much better position than doing it after your auditors find it. Poll question. Okay, thank you, April. I'm going to launch question 10 here. And question 10 asks, to prepare for the single audit, it is recommended to discuss the timeline with the auditors, gather grant documents, reconcile the general ledger to the CIFA, or all of the above. So this one feels like an easy one, but is it one of April's tricky questions? <laughs> You'll have to see. Answers are coming in pretty quickly here. So um, just 10 more seconds and then I'll close this one. I, I don't think I'm like selling anybody on taking my course wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's good. It's it's good quality education. If it was easy, people wouldn't learn as, as much. I think so. Um, last That's couple of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, get your answers in, everybody, for your CPE credit. Last chance. Going once. Going twice. And I'm ending the poll there and sharing the results. And April. I don't think many people fell for your trick. Oh, I am so proud of you. 99% <laughs> got all of the above. Great job, everyone. Yes, please do those things. <laughs> all right. This is uh, next section is really kind of a revisit of what we just talked about, but we think it's really important. So we wanted to just hit it one more time. Um, so staying compliant, how, uh, you know, we talked about who needs a single audit? What are some pitfalls? What do um, you know? What are our recommendations? Well, this is a little bit more of that recommendation. How do I stay compliant, and what kind of controls are important? Um, this applies pretty much to all of your um, grants. It's a good thing to kind of think about. Is always you should you should be again in the pandemic. It was a special situation, but you should be reviewing your policies pretty regularly. You know, annually or. Um, biannually to see what's changed. You know, did you get a new accounting system? Have we had a reorganization? Did one really star person retire and things changed, right? Make sure those are all up to date and that it's what you're actually doing. Don't have policies in place that you're not following. That's a really good way to get in trouble. And then just to prevent things from happening, this is so key for fraud prevention in reality is understanding, um, making sure your staff, anybody involved in the process understands why they're doing what they're doing. Um, when I worked um, in government, we had people who we required to sign off um, that they had reviewed their purchasing card transactions, right, on their P cards. They didn't understand why they had to do it. It was a, it was a hassle. They had one department was like, oh, you have to come in from the field and we don't want to do that. So they pre-signed a bunch, right? Guess where fraud happened? It happened in the P-card transactions because those department heads didn't understand why we were having them do it. They just said one more thing finance wants us to do. So when anybody involved in your control process, it really needs to understand why they're doing it. They need to, they need to have some kind of regular um, communication with them about what they're doing really is important. And it's not just finance imposing one more pain in the behind policy on them. I, I'm, I'm really emphasizing that because it's shocking once we talk to those department heads, how they really, if you're not trained in finance, you don't really think about that naturally. And you get so focused on your mission um, that you don't necessarily uh, understand why we ask them to do the things they're doing. So I think that's very important. Make sure you understand the grant agreements. Again, with CRF, we had no grant agreements unless you were a subrecipient. Um, but we had the FAQs and other guidance. Make sure you really understand what you're being held to. 
um, getting that uh, catalog of federal regulations where you, you can actually see what the regulations are, getting the compliance supplement when it's been issued will help you understand which of those compliance areas are most important and that your auditors will be looking at and making sure you communicate that out to people who are making the decisions on spending and reporting. Some common findings we're seeing, you know, we're, we're kind of like doing our first big round of, um, of that, that pandemic spend audits, the single audits, and we are definitely seeing some of the um, lack of evidence in the controls. Um, and, um, and again, it's, it's in most cases, it's related to a combination of pressure from almost all levels um, of Everybody around you is yelling at you to spend the money, spend the money, um, lack of guidance, and then the change in working conditions, um, both with remote work and with people being out sick or with sick relatives. That was like a perfect storm for controls not really being followed. And even if they were followed, perhaps not being documented, so there's no proof they happened. Um, if you're not used to getting grants, if this is if, if CRF was kind of like, ah, we don't usually get grants, but we got this huge amount of money, what do we do now? Um, you may not even have those controls. You may not have that documentation. And so really, uh, we've seen a few of those where people, their first single audit ever, and they just didn't know they should have this kind of documentation. So in not having them at all or it not following the normal rules because of the nature of the conditions we were in. We've seen a lot with procurement policies and practices that don't conform to uniform guidance. There was an update um, not that long ago um, with a revision. Those requirements are out there in the uniform guidance. You may have beautiful purchasing and procurement policies, but they don't actually follow this guidance because you're not used to getting grants. Again, making sure that that is in place and that you're following them. And one thing associated with procurement is suspension and debarment requirements. And I'll just say it again, if you're not used to federal grant funding, you may not even be aware that all these exist. And so making sure you have the controls in place, the policies and procedures that require it, and that you have um, educated the people in your departments or out in the um, depart other departments, if you're decentralized, that these are really important. And when they hear federal grant money or federal assistance money, they should think, ooh, there's extra stuff I have to do. And I know who to go ask to make sure I get it done. And then missing finding, missing documentation. Again, the change in work environment has made this uh, much more prevalent than it is in our normal routine day-to-day -day grants that we typically audit. Um, it may be that a lot of things happen by email and those emails have been purged or nobody can find them. It may be that there were 10,000 transactions and nobody knows how to go through them to find the sample that the auditors have asked for. We've seen that, that it was, we just had too many and it's just this giant box and it's in no order. We've got the documentation, but we can't get it. Um, or we got it and somebody shoved it in a drawer and we don't know where that drawer is. And so document retention is really important, whether it's electronic um, emails and things like that, or whether it's in paper. All right, poll question, we're almost there. Thank you, April. I've launched poll question 11 and that one asks, some common single audit, audit findings are missing documentation, fraud and theft, procurement issues and policies, or all of the above. And I'm going to step in here and me a culpa this. There are two right answers. So I'm going to give you credit for either of the two right answers. This should make it a lot easier. Wow, that is a tricky question. <laughs> it is. It's it tricky without the caveat I just gave. I think I might have just made it a lot easier. So there are two right answers. You guys have a 50-50 shot on this. <laughs> and I would expect assume that those of you who use your logic can under can guess that if there are two right answers one of them is probably not all of the above so <laughs> now you've got a much higher percentage <laughs> very good well and uh, i'm going to keep things moving quickly here so last few minutes a few seconds to get your questions in uh, your, your your answers in uh, we're a couple of minutes behind schedule we are coming up close to the end uh, so i'm going to wrap it up here in a couple of seconds so going once Going twice, ending the poll. April, there's the results. How did people do with this tricky question? They did pretty well. So the answers were missing documentation or procurement issues. Those are our two that are really common. 
Um, fraud and theft, we don't see a ton of that. And so that's why all of the above is probably not correct, but um, good job and sorry about the slightly wonky question. Okay, so next up, I think, Gwen, is it back to you now? That it is. Our last section here is going to be at least an overview of the funding from the American Rescue Plan. Okay, so here are the big categories that were included there. We already talked a little bit about the Education Stabilization Fund, you know, that that was included in the ARP. This $350 billion pool for 21.027, the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. Uh, for breaking news, the addendum to the compliance supplement that covers this program, as well as some portions of 84.425 that were not previously covered, was released this week. So any single audits that have been placed on hold Due to waiting for that to be released, well, it has been released now. Um, for the rest of these programs, as said, information has not been released yet, still pending. This did also include the Homeowner Assistance Fund, the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund, and the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. So our largest topic here in the last section here will be the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. It's the SLRF, FRF, as you can see, I can't even type that correctly half the time. I do not enjoy this acronym. So I'll just probably call it the Fiscal Recovery Fund. Um, direct payments went out to states, tribal governments, metro cities and counties. Those would be um, entitlement units as defined for CDBG purposes. And states also received additional payments that were to go out to non-entitlement units of local government. That's usually your smaller cities and counties and such. And spending of these funds is in progress as we speak. So uses, again, very broad general category here. Respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency and the negative economic impacts. Some specific areas that are addressed in the FAQs include vaccination programs, testing and contract tests, tracing, public health surveillance. Now that's kind of like how they're sequencing out all the different variances and stuff that falls into that surveillance right there. Vaccination incentives and back to work programs that we have seen, some medical costs and associated enhancements to healthcare capacity, that does include physical plant improvements, such as maybe constructing or adapting a new clinic. Um, support for individuals placed under isolation or quarantine and support for vulnerable populations. If you were all um, aware that maybe people with lower standards of living to begin with were disproportionately affected as lower wage jobs kind of dried up there for a while. Also, seniors living on fixed incomes and those that typically rely on programs such as those offered at senior centers or mothers that rely on childcare being available in order to work. Those may all be considered vulnerable populations. Um, costs related to congregate living facilities, schools, and other key locations to keep everything kind of as sanitary as possible and as safe as possible are also allowable uses. Um, here's some more that are kind of focused more through the negative economic impacts aspect of this. Um, assistance to households, small businesses, nonprofits, and impacted industries premium pay for essential workers, lost revenues, which we will discuss some, necessary investments in water, sewer, and broadband. We'll have more information on that as well. And in general, costs that were allowable under the Coronavirus Relief Fund are also allowable here, except for these two categories. That administrative uh, convenience item for public health and safety payroll, that is no longer a blanket. You can charge whatever you need to here. 
the payroll that's charged must now be for time that is dedicated to responding to the pandemic. And that is defined here, you know, if at least 50% of that employee's time specifically, or that employee's department or operational unit is at least 50% of, you know, considered to be responding to COVID-19, 100% of that payroll may be charged to the fiscal recovery fund. Um, so that is going to be something that is going to take some documentation to establish. Uh, in some cases, that will be pretty simple. For example, EMS employees, you know, most likely you can make a blanket statement that 50% of their time is at least related in some way to COVID-19. Also, probably your public health employees, if it's, say, a county health office uh, also, employees who work, say, in a correctional facility or similar, where there are all of the new procedures and processes in place. Uh, there's also this thing about tax anticipation notes, those costs not eligible. Um, so these are intentionally broad. I wanted to point out real quick. Lost revenues, they are chargeable here but then the money that's derived from those lost revenues must be used to provide government services. Those revenues cannot then be used to save, replenish a rainy day fund or similar. Um, and also in the payroll items, the guidance does make it clear that not only those folks who are on the ground actually dealing with say patients or prisoners, maybe exposed to COVID-19 would be allowable, but also support staff for those people and their direct supervisory staff would be uh, considered chargeable payroll under this program. A quick discussion for assistance to households. This could be cash payments, could be other assistance, such as maybe making a payment directly to a utility or a landlord. Uh, emergency assistance, you know, if there needs to be a burial and the family members do not have the resources to pay for that. Uh, home repairs and weatherization. Ensuring that households have decent internet access and are digitally literate. You know, both employees and students need to be able to access those online resources for their education and their work to keep going also employment supports. Uh, just one more time, I will harp on the child care assistance. Um, that is extremely important for a lot of parents to be able to go back to work. Um, this may be, and um, applications may be required on an individual basis where the families need to prove that they are eligible for the assistance. But there are also ways to determine that an entire population as a whole is eligible and they may just need to request funding. This could be a household that experienced unemployment or food insecurity, however you wish to define that, or a household that is qualified as low or moderate income. And assistance to small businesses. This could be in many forms, not only grants, but also loans will, will be repaid. In-kind assistance, technical assistance, and other services, uh, just depending on what the local economy needs. But this must go out to businesses that have had a negative economic impact. This could be looked at for specific industries, for example, tourism, hospitality, and food services, but of course have had a big impact. Um, businesses that had gross revenue that declined, uh, there's suggestions to use similar criteria to determine those as was used for the PPP program. Another category is smallest businesses that maybe did not have resources to weather the disruptions. Businesses that serve disadvantaged communities and businesses that have less access to credit. Those, would all, those could all be considered kind of categorically eligible for assistance. Okay, we have our last polling question here. Thank you, Gwen. Polling question number 12 asks, 
Some allowable SLFRF uses are vaccination incentives, assistance to households, necessary investments in water and sewer, or is it all of the above? And I think this must be a Gwen written question because I don't think there's a trick, any tricks to this one. I think this is uh, one of Gwen's. We are gonna move pretty quickly here because we are coming up on time here. And I'm just gonna give five more seconds to get your answers in. So please make a choice and get your answers in and we will wrap this up. Last couple of seconds, going once, going twice. Okay, I'm ending the poll, sharing the results. Gwen, how did everybody do? Great, the majority of people did pick all of the above and that is correct. Okay, some more information on the uses. Um, services are allowable in qualified census tracts. Um, those are typically your lower income neighborhoods, for example, and pretty much anything provided by a tribal government. This is designed to benefit low income populations that were disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Um, some overall purposes are here. These are broad categories and there are many services that can be considered in this category. The public health and related outreach, community and domestic violence intervention, supportive housing and services for individuals experiencing homelessness, development of affordable housing, housing vouchers, early learning services, tutoring and after-school programs. See, there is a focus here on healthy childhood environments. Um, support for students' social, emotional, and mental health needs. Um, that has been a big topic as students go back to school. A lot are behind and a lot had some negative emotional and social impact. Um, child care. Home visiting services for families with small children, as well as elderly and vulnerable populations. These are all potential services that can be offered with the fiscal recovery funds. Yep, water and sewer projects. We have also seen several of these uh, that are being undertaken. In general, until there is better guidance, Really, the uses align with those for the drinking water state revolving fund and the clean water state revolving fund. And so the DWSRF, that's the drinking water. You see here, this is just a list of the types of programs that are allowable there. The FRF guidance does emphasize the lead service line replacement. Um, for example, that is what is wrong with Flint, Michigan's lines. The uh, lead is leaching into the drinking water and that is not safe. So curing situations like that is an allowable use. For the clean water, um, there is an emphasis here in the FRF for environmental uh, improvements, um, ensuring compliance with the Clean Water Act, and um, also water reuse and recycling. As a desert dweller here, I understand exactly how important water conservation is. Um, broadband projects. So the broadband projects that are allowable are typically those that would be designed to increase the speeds to a minimum threshold for areas, both for people, individuals, and businesses that do not have a fast internet. Um, there are some provisions there for maybe potentially offering lower speeds in areas where due to topography, for example, higher speeds are not possible. I'm thinking where they might need to do some satellite internet rather than being able to run fiber optic cables, for example. I can also provide assistance with cybersecurity and training to households that may not be as technologically adept. Okay, and finally, the lost revenue. So this is calculated on an entity-wide basis. There are four 
dates at which this is measured. There is a um, formula here that I'm not going to go into because I did not major in math. However, there are plenty of examples of how this is applied, and this is directly from the guidance. So the definition of revenue that's used in the lost revenue calculation is from the Census Bureau. It includes certain items, revenues from taxes, current charges, and miscellaneous general revenue, as well as intergovernmental transfers between state and local governments. You will notice that that does not include intergovernmental transfers from the federal government. That is excluded there. There are also other items that are excluded. Um, one thing that actually surprised me when I started looking into this is that revenues generated by utilities are specifically excluded from this definition. So this flow chart is, or it's really more of an organizational chart looking thing, is also directly from the guidance from Treasury. For those of us that are visual learners, this provides a handy diagram of what would and would not be considered in the lost revenue calculations. So in contrast to the HERF ones, there is that specific formula that has to be used for the fiscal recovery fund. That's going to change the documentation required here. Okay, as it relates to the lost revenue. So that's going to be a lot simpler. It is mostly just figuring out which categories of revenue will be included in that calculation and then supporting those. So best practices here, document characteristics of the program that's put into place. You know, if we're dealing with the different individual business, et cetera, grants. Uh, again, procurements need to be documented and that all policies and procedures need to be complied with. Now, real quick, we are at the very end of our time, but I would like to at least mention the other funding that is in here. First of all, the Homeowner Assistance Fund. So this gives assistance to homeowners basically focused on making sure that people are able to stay in their homes after economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and also that they may keep internet and utilities going. On the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund, this requires application to the treasury, so each project is going to be different and unique, but they must be related to COVID-19, directly enable work, education, health monitoring, and unserved or underserved populations must benefit. Emergency Rental Assistance Program, um, this is similar to the homeowners program, except that it is geared towards people who rent their home. Um, and there are eligible household considerations as listed here, as well as a reference to what a low income family is as defined by the United States Housing Act of 1937, which just keeps getting updated. Okay, so that is the end of our session here. Uh, Rob, is there anything else that we would like to discuss right now? No, that no. was excellent. I'm just going to wrap us up here. We um, we received a couple of questions during the um, during the presentation and before as well, but I think all of them have actually been addressed in the content. I know that lost revenue has been a big uh, a big topic for a lot of people, so I'm glad you you covered that one, April. Uh, sorry, Gwen. And, and the other thing that we did get asked about was whether the slides would be available. Now, our marketing team have put a link in the Q&A section for anyone who wants to get access to the, to the slideshow presentation. So I really have nothing further to, to add. I think we've addressed all of the questions. Um, and with that, I would just thank everyone for their participation, listening, uh, and, and I hope they enjoyed this session. We will be doing more sessions throughout the year there's another one in april uh, and then two more throughout the year roughly once a quarter we do them so please stay tuned follow cri on on our social media sites and, and uh, our, our website and uh, yeah we we'll hopefully we'll see everyone again at our next session which is coming up in uh, in april 
So thank you all for your time. Have a good day, everybody.